Alexander ends up leading a charge into the middle of a mass of Persian cavalry fighting hand to hand. He is almost killed. You know, the plume of his helmet is chopped off. So Philip, as a teenager, spends best part of three years as a hostage in Thebes, in this southern Greek city that is the military and political power of the day. Why shouldn't we stand up to the Macedonians? You know, what have we got to lose? I'm sure it'll be, we've beaten everybody else. Why should they be any different? So your reputation counts for less in a more divided society, a different political set on it. You've told us we were off to conquer Persia. We've done it. We've defeated the empire. We've got vengeance. Okay, you said we had to go and find Darius, make sure he was dead. Well, we've done that. He is dead. But suddenly we keep on advancing. You know, if you didn't think you had much chance of beating the enemy in the open field, you could retire behind your walls and wait for him to go away. And the <laughs> odds were that eventually he would. But once you have an army like Philip's that will come and will stay and besiege you and eventually capture your city, suddenly the rules have changed. You know, it's always you, when you write about someone, you develop a strong feeling towards them. So I found I, my opinion of Mark Antony declined writing the book on him. <laughs> that for both Caesar and Augustus increased. For Philip, it greatly increased. Alexander, it did, but it sort of in a slightly different way. Alexander the Great might be the most famous historical figure whose battleground victories inspired millions of people, including some other famous historical figures such as Julius Caesar and Napoleon. Philip II, on the other hand, is only known to people who study the ancient world. Yet without Philip, there would have been no Alexander the Great. In this episode, I interviewed Dr. Adrian Goldsworthy, a historian and author who wrote numerous books about the ancient world, including the fantastic book Philip and Alexander, Kings and Conquerors, which covers the lives of this father and son duo. This conversation barely scratches the surface of the epic story, so if you like what you hear, you should certainly read the book. Without further ado, actually, don't forget to subscribe. And now to the interview. Alexander the Great, obviously everybody knows about the person, but I'm curious, how has his success overshadowed his father, Philip, for us? It's it's very much so. I mean, that it's one of those retrospective things. Obviously, all history is hindsight. We look back, we know what's going to happen, what comes along next. So we tend to see highlights as if they're leading towards an inevitable conclusion but the sheer fact that your son is called the great means that obviously <laughs> you you know you've got a, a i would say a tough act to follow but in fact of course you're not following you've gone before but um it, it is difficult and even in the ancient world it, it's it's interesting that um you know the biographer plutarch who wrote of the the great men of, of the greek and roman worlds and did these paired lives didn't write one about philip and you feel the only reason he didn't do that is because he wrote one about Alexander and there'd be a bit about Philip, but also you know, everybody's heard of Alexander. Everyone wants to know about Alexander because really and truly some of the other people that Plutarch covers didn't achieve anything like as much as Philip. So it, it is unfortunate. It, it's, it's partly um, there's another element that so many of the sources for Philip that were written in his lifetime or soon afterwards haven't survived from antiquity, but then Partly that's also because Alexander is so famous that everybody copied those books again and again, hence those survive rather than the earlier histories. But no, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things where the son did so much and so quickly and so spectacularly and then died young, never had a chance to be old, to be limping, to be one eyed. You know, Philip's only <laughs> middle aged. He's not, not that old. Um, but Alexander is perpetually youthful you know that's that's the image we have that's because he you know he's only in his early 30s so everything he does just overshadows Philip and he hasn't hasn't ever really stepped out from that if Alexander was not born or wasn't as successful do you think Philip would Philip would have a similar place in history certainly he'd have a place for turning Macedonia around but it's almost mm -hmm. it is very hard to separate the two Philip had come to dominate southern Greece, the Greece of the famous cities, Athens, Thebes, Sparta, Corinth, all of these, and lots of other city-states. And he'd achieved that in a very short time. And he'd turned things around from Macedonia being on the point of being torn apart by neighbors to becoming the dominant power in the Greek world. But with all successful leaders, a lot depends on how permanent their, their achievements are. You know, can they pass this power on, this success on to someone else? In Philip's case, of course, along comes Alexander and goes off and does even more spectacular things. But um, who knows, if there'd been no Alexander, Philip had no adult, legitimate, recognized, capable son as an mm -hmm. alternative. So 
Macedonia in the past has frequently been prey to civil war. It's one of the reasons it's been so weak most of the time. It could have collapsed just as quickly as it had, had established, just as um, you know, Jason of Ferrai, the um, tyrant in Thessaly to the south, had been almost sort of predecessor of Philip. We don't really remember him at all, but Greeks did. You know, this is someone who united lots of cities, had a very successful army, was doing many of the things Philip was doing, but then leaves the scene and there is no no one succeeds to his power, so is forgotten. So mm. it's it's always precarious in the same way that although Alexander's empire does crack up into these smaller um, kingdoms, they're still pretty big. You know, the Seleucids, the Antigonids, the, the Ptolemies in Egypt. So there's enough to continue that legacy and that sense of the Hellenic culture. So even Alexander, to some extent, would be less famous if it had fallen apart far faster. So it's difficult. You, you can never separate people from what follows. But um, I think Philip would have been important, but that, that importance is cemented by Alexander. Is there a chance that Philip would actually be even less unknown if Alexander wasn't as successful? Quite possibly. I mean, if Alexander had been just a king of Macedonia and mm. been strong and preserved Macedonian dominance in that area, we'd probably talk about him. But it's mm. unlikely there would have been as much written and as much to survive as the man who leads his army all the way to India. It's staggering. And, and, and it partly is one of the problems because Philip had achieved what he'd done relatively quickly that there were plenty of people around when Alexander died who could remember Macedonia being nowhere. You know, this weak, rather barbaric, uncivilized kingdom to the north of Greece, sort of almost Greek, but not quite, preyed on by its neighbors, whether the Greeks to the south or the Illyrians or the Thracians and various others. You know, Macedonia hadn't mattered. Suddenly, Philip turns it into a power within the region, dominates Greece, and then Alexander takes that and goes and takes on the biggest empire in the known world and defeats it and replaces it and then keeps going. So it is all spectacular and it is all um, a shock that had he not done this or had Alexander died early on in his campaigns, had he fallen at Granicus, had he fallen in any of the sieges, died of sickness or illness, as, as you know, the sources tell us could have happened on several occasions, again, we probably wouldn't know quite so much about him. So yes, there's an element where each success makes them famous, but it needs the successes that follow for them to become this, this big figure that, that dominates the, the memory of antiquity. You know, the Greeks and Romans are obsessed with Alexander, and while some like him and some don't, there is still, he is such a dominant figure. When you look at later Roman emperors, anyone who goes and campaigns anywhere in the eastern part, beyond the eastern Mediterranean, in Asia Minor or beyond, there are immediately comparisons to Alexander, you know, and the, the flatterers want to say, this is the new Alexander come to go, and whether it's um, Crassus, whether it's Mark Antony, whether it's Gaius Caesar, whether it's Trajan, whether it's Septimius Severus, whether it's the Emperor Julian in the fourth century, again and again, they keep coming back to Alexander. What do we know about Philip before he became a king? Well, that's the thing. We, we tend to remember Philip as how he fits into Alexander's story, as the, the aging man, the wounded man, the, the man who's been successful. We forget where he started. He is the youngest of three brothers. They're sons of the king of Macedonia, but he has other wives and other sons. There was no probability, really, that Philip would ever become king in the beginning. And his oldest brother becomes king before he does, but he's not doing too well. There's negotiations with Thebes, the, the dominant military power in southern Greece at the time. So Philip, as a teenager, spends best part of three years as a hostage in Thebes, in this southern Greek city that is the military and political power of the day. And you know that's something, again, that's very hard to imagine for Alexander. Alexander was never hostage anywhere. He was never going to be because Philip has made Macedonia so strong. But it's a reminder of just how weak it was. But this is a a youngster who grows up in an aristocratic Greek household, who hunts, who goes to the gymnasium and exercises, who listens to philosophical lectures and all the things that a cultured man ought to do, but it is effectively a prisoner, a hostage. And then his oldest brother is murdered. The second brother succeeds. He reigns for a few years, but then is killed in battle fighting against the Illyrians along with most of the Macedonian army. So Philip becomes king very young, just like Alexander. And we remember Alexander as the young, dashing, good-looking hero. Philip is exactly the same in his day. And he's, like Alexander, largely unproven as well. He hasn't done a lot. You know, he's been a hostage. He hasn't led armies into battle. But over the course of a winter, he's able to turn around 
the Macedonian army, reform it and inspire the men so that the next year they go back and defeat the Illyrians. And then he starts to fend off one enemy after another. But you know, this is a, a Philip who's inheriting a throne unexpectedly because the last two kings, his older brothers, have died, is challenged by relatives, including his half-brothers, is faced with much more powerful enemies on all sides. This is a Philip who is young, who is dashing, who is capable, who is very confident in himself. And there's there's an emphasis on he turns things around because he goes around talking to the Macedonians and addressing them and inspiring. There's a lot of personality here and oratory as well. So the things a young aristocrat should do, but um, it's we don't have the detail as we'll have for Alexander, but this is someone who's come from this Greek culture and is imbued with it, but also is someone who is living a much more dangerous life than Alexander, mm-hmm. at least at the start. And once you become king, then that makes you the target for everybody. So it's just that you know, each time he wins a victory, he knows there's going to be another challenge very soon if there isn't one already. He's got to keep winning and keep winning. So that's the difference. Philip grows up in that sort of world, which is not the world of Alexander. Because he was in Thebes, he learned things from uh, Thebes, which was a major power back then, right? Do we know anything about that part? Well, we always assume he learned a lot, and the, mm-hmm. the the ancient sources sort of you know give this impression, partly because obviously they know what Philip's going to do, and like all true Southern Greeks, they want to say, well, we're the ones who taught him. You know, the reason he's so good <laughs> is he learned from us, and you always have to be a bit careful. The Romans are very fond of this form of snobbery. You know, the most dangerous enemies they face are people they trained, like Arminius <laughs> in Germany and this sort of thing, or civilists later on. Um, so. There's an element of that. We don't know very much. Very little is really said. And scholars have imagined that Philip you know, spoke to people like Epaminondas, the, the general who would eventually die facing mm-hmm. the Spartans, but would defeat them twice. Um, they go on about the sacred band. One problem is we don't know much about Macedonia. We know very little about Thebes as well. It's nearly always seen from the point of view of Greek outsiders. It's As with most of Greek history, it's, it's dominated by the viewpoint of, of the Athenian aristocracy, the Athenian well-to-do, who see Thebans and others as rather strange foreigners. You know, they're not quite like us. They're nowhere near as good as us. They're a bit weird. So people have sometimes said, oh, well, Philip saw how you had a disciplined army mattered, how a phalanx mattered, how different tactics, deep formations, the things the Thebans were doing. And it's possible. You know, a lot Mm -hmm. of, you do find conversation amongst politicians and military leaders often revolves a lot around politics and military affairs because that's what they're interested in. So he may well have heard a lot of this. How much he works out from first principles himself is harder to judge. Um, there are no, you know, the army he'll create in Macedonia isn't by any stretch of the imagination a direct copy of anything the Thebans have done. So he's taken elements, perhaps. He's, he's looked at this and thought, all right, this is good, this works. But then he's created something that is distinctively Macedonian. So, again, it probably matters. It's probably important, but it's rather like so many other encounters with Alexander. And we'll probably talk later about Alexander and Aristotle. We imagine far more than the sources can actually confirm as to how important this is for people. But you you assume it is in the same way that you know you if you hear of somebody going to a famous university, you think, well, this will have an important impact on them and maybe it did or maybe you know they didn't really pay attention and they <laughs> they they spent most of the three or four years skiving off and you know, <laughs> getting drunk or whatever who knows it, it's um it might be it probably is but we can't be certain and what did philip bring new to the macedonia first of all it, it's just confidence i mean you 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 have a reform of the army but it's very difficult to know how quickly philip brings in the various innovations. So he will create a far more balanced, sophisticated, tactically sound Macedonian army that's unlike anything that's really been seen before in Greece, because he takes, in the past, the Macedonians have had very good cavalry, but they don't have the hoplite class of the Greek city-state because they don't really have developed cities within the the kingdom. It's more of a, the, the, the infantry tend to be the poorer, um, citizens who aren't so well equipped, who aren't so drilled. Philip gives them the sarissa, this two-handed spear or pike that can be eventually up to about 21 feet long. So it's a very big piece of kit and gives them a small shield. It's not designed for subtlety. 
It's mm -hmm. designed for keeping the enemy a long way away. But if there's enough of you packed close together, the enemy simply can't get to you. And if you keep on pushing forward and jabbing forward, eventually he's probably going to give way. Whether that comes in over the first winter or develops a bit longer doesn't help. But then he, he uses those good infantry with the very good cavalry. The biggest innovation that Philip brings in is actually one of the least understood. And it's one where it's, it's hard to see an influence of, of Thebes because the one thing he creates, apart from, well, two things, really. One is that the army can is better supplied, so it can stay in the field for much more of the year, much longer. It can march very fast and surprise the enemy. It's not just short seasonal campaigns. Philip will fight you in winter, and he'll try and creep up on you when you're not looking. But also, something that develops from quite early in the reign is their ability to take walled strongholds, particularly cities. Sieges are something that Greek armies have never been very good at up until this point. Because it requires persistence, you've got to stay there a long time, it requires engineering skill, and it requires a willingness, if you actually assault, to take a lot of casualties among your bolder men. And on mm -hmm. the whole, the cities haven't wanted to do that and haven't been able to do that. Philip creates a system that does, and this fundamentally changes warfare, because up until now, if you didn't think you had much chance of beating the enemy in the open field, you could retire behind your walls and wait for him to go away. And the <laughs> odds were that eventually he would. But once you have an army like Philip's that will come and will stay and besiege you and eventually capture your city, suddenly the rules have changed. You start thinking, well, actually, maybe I better negotiate. Maybe I, I better seek peace. Now, this change, we know Philip hires specialists, engineers from, from all over the Greek world. And some of these developments have been going on in the Western Greek cities like Syracuse in Sicily, where you've got tyrants and less democratic rules so it's it's a little bit easier to sort of focus resources on a military budget than mm -hmm. when everybody's voting for for this and they don't really want permanent institutions like an army or an um, engineering corps so philip creates something like that it just makes his warfare much more decisive and the combination of this army that can stay in the field longer makes it much more intensive so philip does spend nearly all his reign fighting someone virtually every year there is at least one campaign and sometimes more than one and that's a big difference to anything again that leaders in most of the cities have have thought about before so it's and it's partly it's it has a momentum of its own because you know as the um a roman historian will later say of philip that he made war like a, a merchant in that he spends the profits of this recent victory to pay for the next campaign and the next campaign. So he needs to keep on winning, but he keeps on expanding. He doesn't hold on to his money or his profits. This is just used to make things better. So there's an element of that, but that is a really big change. That that fundamentally shifts warfare. And, we, um, and it's something, again, that we'll see with Alexander and people don't always concentrate on to, as, as much as they should. But this, the ability to take cities just gives Philip an advantage that for a long time, nobody else has. But we don't know exactly what, was the secret sauce, right? Is it his uh, willingness to lose his bravest people who go ahead or something engineers do? What, what's, uh, what was the secret sauce for them? It's a mixture. I mean, a lot of it is engineering. He does start to build siege engines, whether it's siege towers, both mobile ones, platforms for artillery. At some point, you get the development of torsion artillery that's more powerful because it's mm -hmm. based on twisted sinews rather than just simply being a big bow. Um, that at least at first, until the defenders start to adapt and fortifications improve, you can certainly knock down the parapets of walls, but sometimes even breach walls themselves. So there is, there is a technical element to this, and that technical element requires someone to pay people to think about this, to work this out, to build these things and operate these things. And then combined with that, you need to be able to keep your army in one place to blockade and surround that city and keep the soldiers fed stop disease from destroying the army so you need some basic organization and sanitation in the camp mm -hmm. to you know, just give you a bit more of a chance as far as as ancient uh peoples can understand this but there's clearly there is a tradition that comes through quite early on in the romans that you know you, if you're an organized army you have to be careful where you put the latrine something as simple as that how that where the tent lines are how things are organized so there's that and then the persistence to where necessary attack because one thing an impression we get from many of the sieges of, is of Philip launching a lots of little attacks that aren't really expected to seize the fortification, but they make the defenders come out and fight you. Mm -hmm. And both then and later, the pattern seems to be that although you suffer casualties in this, they're mostly wounds. 
very few fatalities. It's people killed in their unprotected. You know, they've got body armor and a helmet to protect the most vital parts of themselves. So they're they're wounded in the limbs and they have a chance of recovering, as Philip will. You know, he's repeatedly wounded, and many of the wounds, the vast majority, come in sieges when he's close to the enemy and somebody shoots him or hits him with a stone. Same with Alexander. Um, so there is that. Then there is that aggression. You will go, you know, you've got the men who will lead the assault by climbing ladders or coming across the ramp of a siege tower and fight their way into the enemy city. And sometimes it doesn't work and you lose a lot of those boldest men, but you have a culture of rewarding them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, apart from the the whole concept that's, that's probably traditional, but is um, added to under Philip and then Alexander, the sense that you're, the rest of the Macedonians are your companions. You know, they are sharing with you in this. They share the danger, but they also share the spoils of victory. So again, Philip is very strong. He increases the number of companions who will serve as cavalrymen, but it's noticeable as well. Those men, just like the king himself, will also serve in sieges. They don't say, well, I fight from horseback, so I'm not doing this. They are the ones who will also lead charges and lead assaults. So it's, it's again, it's this culture of emulation of, but everything is rewarded. You do well and you fight bravely for Philip and you take risks and you suffer, but you will benefit from this. What's interesting is you said that they suffer very little losses. It's usually wounds. And that's where I personally always admired Philip and Alexander, that they were, le- they were leading their armies into battle. And I was thinking like, well, this is a risky uh, enterprise. It, it's one of those yeah. things that puzzled me while I was doing the book, because whenever you get figures for casualties and where they mention the wounded, very often it's something like 10 times as many wounded as killed. And the number of fatalities, you know, you look at a battle like Granicus and the number of fatalities is very small in what's clearly perceived by everyone as a really nasty, brutal, close in fight mm-hmm. and confused. That isn't about subtlety. It's just about hacking your way through a lot of, you know, very motivated Persians. So while there's always a pattern and you can see it time and again in ancient warfare, that the, the biggest losses are suffered when an army runs away. And where the victors chase after them and kill men that are helpless, that are not defending themselves. That's the that's why there's always a disproportionately heavy loss for the losers. And that's something that, again, Philip and Alexander, because they have good cavalry who will keep pursuing, uh, that they, they, you know, the plan is you don't have to fight this same enemy next year because you've, you've so damaged them now that they don't recover. But it, it did strike me as odd. But you, you get this sometimes where on those rare occasions you get similar descriptions for instance in josephus talking about the the jewish rebellion against nero the first century a.d on several occasions he'll mention a day of intensive fighting and then tell you that maybe 10 romans have been killed but 100 or more you know more lots more wounded part of this is because particularly when it's the combat is using missiles in the ancient world that these are low velocity weapons most of them are quite slow but also very visible you know, you can see a javelin coming towards you. You can even see an arrow coming towards you. And that gives you more chance to use your shield or to dodge. Unless it, they're at very close range, most of these things do not have the momentum and the, the force to go through body mm-hmm. armor. The body armor seems to have been good. It seems to have done a good job to protect the vitals. There's something else that's striking when you, you read of Philip's family, but also the wider world, is the number of Macedonians who live very long lives, even though they fight a lot. And you'll hmm. see it with the successors, these people who are commanding armies in their 70s and beyond, you know, they're, because many of the men that contest for Alexander's empire had been Philip's senior commanders. You know, they were middle-aged then, and they're still going strong. And if you don't kill a member of the Macedonian royal family, he does seem to live a very long time. <laughs> so you start to wonder, are they just, you know, they're, there's something about that lifestyle that makes them particularly tough. But because both Philip and Alexander recover from a lot of wounds. Now, while you can argue that many of these were probably not, not life-threatening, you still have to think of all the risks of infection. Yeah. And yet they seem to manage. They don't, they don't suffer from that. And that seems to be true of many of the others, um, where you get other Macedonian leaders mentioned, other, other figures, and presumably extending down to the men in the ranks. Because again, the army that Alexander takes to over to Asia consists overwhelmingly of Philip's men. And, you know, you've even got the comment from Justin where it's the the emphasis is that he chose the veterans. He didn't choose the young soldiers, the raw recruits. Mm -hmm. He chose the men who are already proven. So they're already, they fought for 10, maybe 20 years under Philip. And of course, you'll have the 
the veterans who will go on and play a prominent role in the early years of the wars of the successors, by which time <laughs> these men are, are very, very old, even by the standards of, say, Napoleon's old guard or something. And yet they're still clearly scaring the living daylights out of everyone they encounter. They really are as tough as old boots. But that's but coming back, as I say, to the the, the high ratio of wounded to to fatalities, this this seems particularly true in sieges. It may reflect the particular warfare at that time that there are fewer weapons that will kill someone outright. There are far more that will inflict wounds that may cumulatively wear you down, mm. may take you out of the action at the time, but don't, um, you know, you are able to recover from even with the fairly rudimentary medical treatments available. But it, it is one of those oddities of this period. We know Philip in hindsight, right? So we know what he's accomplished. I'm curious what event or what battle put Philip in the, on the map uh, for his contemporaries when they realize that, oh, this is, there is this new guy in Macedon, we should take it seriously? It does take a while because Macedonian kings come and go. And you feel that on the whole, the southern Greek states didn't pay too much attention to Macedonia. They saw it as an area you could exploit. It's got good resources of gold, of silver, of timber, which you need for building warships in particular, but also for many of the big constructions um, just in, in architecture. So I think early on, they're just waiting to see, well, how long will this one last? You know, after all, Philip's two brothers have both died violently after reigns of a couple of years. And although his father had survived longer, he had been chased out, you know, at least once by internal enemies. So they're not expecting much. It is gradual. And the other thing to remember is that, you know, you again have this, this comment later on that, um, you know, Philip watches as if from a high tower while the Greeks fight each other and then sort of pounces when they're weak. That's the other thing. We know Philip's going to be a big deal, and we know Philip's going to dominate. But for most people in the, the southern city states, your more traditional rivals are the big threat. They're the mm -hmm. people you worry about. And they all have lots of other problems because they're all going to war all the time. And Philip gets involved in the South through becoming um, the leader of this the sacred war which really has nothing to do with Macedonia directly, but he's, he's, uh, they appeal to him, he takes up, and then he does remarkably well. But I suspect for a lot of people, even down till 338 and Chironea, which is the, the, obviously the big victory he wins over Athens and Thebes and their allies, they still can't quite take Macedonia seriously. And then you'll see the same, same emotion when Philip dies. They, they just think, well, you know, that's it. It was one man. He was really good. He was really gifted. He was really unscrupulous. But he was, you know, military talent. He's gone. It'll be fine now. We don't have to worry about them. They'll just collapse once again. So it's gradual. And I think it's a slow realization. I don't think there are any particular moments. Even his big victory in 352 BC in the Sacred War, where because of the first intervention, he loses a battle. It's the only really big battlefield defeat he suffers, at least we, that we know about. But he goes back and he wins the next year and inflicts heavy losses on the enemies. But again, it's uh, the thing is, Philip was said to be prouder of his diplomatic successes than his military victories. And we don't always see all of that that's going on. I mean, you can see it a little bit in all his marriages to make alliances with different communities all mm. around him. But it's gradually as... He's making more and more allies and more and more people are bothering to go to Macedonia to seek Philip's approval. But I don't think there is a, a moment, you know, one battle where suddenly, oh, hang on a minute, this is Philip. It's, it's much <laughs> slower, but it's, it comes back to this different type of warfare that he was able to wage and that he doesn't fight for a, a short term solution. He absorbs people. His Macedonia expands very quickly because he captures these cities or they surrender to him because they know that he isn't going to go away, so he'll capture them in the end. And places, you know, up there that are captured by siege, and then he exploits their resources, he gives some of the land to his supporters, he turns them into allies, recruits from them. So Philip sort of grows quite slowly, and I don't think they notice almost until he's become far more powerful and far more dangerous to deal with. I mean, you have people like Demosthenes going on at Athens with these speeches, the, the famous Philippics. But again, we have to remember, we have his speeches, but we don't have many by other orators. And he's just one voice. Mm -hmm. And he's also a politician who needs a cause and finds that in Philip and says, you know, this man's our natural enemy. Philip actually is very nice to the Athenians throughout his life because he, he clearly doesn't want to fight them unless he has to. 
because they've got a fleet and he hasn't and he just you know doesn't he sees it as a difficult proposition better to make friends with them get on with them rather than confront them so you know there are demosthenes is one voice among many but it is i think a gradual gradual process well he eventually somewhat unites uh greece right and then he's killed what do we know about his death it's again one of those mysteries because it, it's his moment of triumph it's finally he's won two years before at 338 he's defeated Thebes and Athens and all their allies, the Battle of Chironea. And while the Athenians and Demosthenes and the like, you know, say they're fighting for the freedom of the Greeks, actually there are loads of Greeks fighting as allies of Philip as well. So it's it's a lot more complicated than obviously Philip would tell things in a different way to the Athenians. But <laughs> nevertheless, by he's then created what modern scholars call the League of Corinth, this alliance of almost all the Greek states, the Spartans standing aloof to unite under a leader to seek vengeance for uh, against the Persians for the you know the um the crimes committed when the Persians invaded nearly a century and a half ago so it's it's a, a fairly sort of strained uh pretext for war but nevertheless it's it's the standard thing you've you've fought wars you defeated enemies you're trying to unite them so find another external enemy and you hopefully you can unite everybody against that enemy so they forget about the more recent uh, squabbles and differences and conflicts so he has done all of this and he's summoned a lot of people have come up to Macedonia to witness the marriage of uh, one of his daughters. So um, all of this is going on. Philip walks into a theater to the great acclaim of everyone, walks alone. You know, Alexander and um, his um, son-in-law come in separately. Philip comes in alone. One of his bodyguards, one of this small group of immediate bodyguards, run forward, stabs Philip to death. Philip dies in seconds. The murderer runs off, trips over and is caught and killed before he get away, but also before he can explain fully why he's done this. And within a matter of hours, Alexander is proclaimed king and he's secure within a matter of days or weeks as, as time follows. So this is very convenient for Alexander. And Alexander suddenly gets a kingdom that's far stronger than it used to be. This incredibly good army that's been trained and has won victory after victory is very confident. You've already started the war against Persia and advance guard has already crossed to Asia Minus. You've got this spectacularly um, you know, big challenging war to fight against the biggest power in the world. So that's dangerous, but it's also exciting. And when you're you know, in your late teens, early 20s, as Alexander is, as are many of his immediate companions you know you think you can do anything at that age it's, it's <laughs> you have that that optimism so philip's death is very convenient no one really knows the the basic story which seems to be from again a fragment where he's mentioned elsewhere seems to have been accepted by alexander this was basic motivation for the assassin posanius was a crime of passion he'd been a lover of philip he'd been um Eventually, Philip had moved on. He is then mistreated, abused, possibly raped by um, a Macedonian aristocrat and his slaves, his servants, his household. And then when he goes and asks for recompense from Philip, he doesn't get it. So it's this grudge that I have not been protected by someone who ought to protect me, who owes me. Um, and that I have not been treated. So it's a matter of honor. My personal honor has been um, trampled. Therefore, this is what I need to do. And I'm blaming you as king for not having done things properly. The question is, was anybody behind this? Because it's a court conspiracy. You can see it two ways. On the one hand, so many Macedonian kings die violently, and it's usually a plot from within their immediate household, within their court. And clearly, when a king like Philip dies, there are people who are looking to exploit the vacuum. Somebody else is going to succeed him. That power has to go somewhere. Alexander is the greatest beneficiary. There were rumors at the time and subsequently in the ancient world that he was involved. Or if he wasn't involved directly, that his mother, Olympias, who is one mm. of Philip's wives, but has fallen out with him and is resenting his um, recent marriage to a much younger and pure blood Macedonian rather than Epirot as she was, wife that her son her alexander is going to be supplanted as the principal heir which is all right up to a point but then any child that's produced by this this new marriage is going to be so young for such a long time that um you know it isn't really a threat for quite a while but it depends again if philip doesn't die violently genetics suggests that you know his family seems to go on a long time so he could live long enough to change his mind about alexander alexander's really the only option as heir at this stage 
but we don't know enough about the relationship between he and Philip. We don't know, for instance, whether or not Philip was going to take Alexander with him on campaign to the east. Um, people tend to often assume that he was going to, but we don't know that. And, you know, we don't know what was going to happen. So there are possibilities. There are also Alexander would later claim that the Persian king was behind it because, which also has a logic to it. Philip's just landed an army in Asia Minor. He's declared war on the Persian empire, is attacking you. The easiest thing to do from a Persian point of view is pay somebody to bump this person off. And then hopefully that means the war will just spatter out. And we can forget about it. So there's logic to that. It's in the Persian king's advantage for Philip to die. The problem is we don't know any of, we we don't know enough to know who's behind it, what's going on. And we don't know enough about the relationship between Philip and Alexander at the time. It had been tense before. There'd been this famous argument between Alexander and his father at his father's wedding feast for his most recent marriage to um, this, as I say, purebred Macedonian that you know, Alexander argues and Philip goes at him with a sword, but trips over because he's drunk. And Alexander goes into temporary exile, but then returns at Philip's bidding. So there are possibilities. There's a lot going on. There's a there's very much a soap opera element to the, the sources, <laughs> which doesn't mean that isn't true, because these are all human beings and they do have emotions as well as political calculation. Alexander moves very quickly to make himself king and he has backers who make sure that he becomes king. But that could simply be that, well, what else is he going to do? His father's dead. Mm -hmm. He is the obvious heir. If anybody else turns up instead, then they're not going to want Alexander around. So essentially, it's again, I become king or I die, uh, or I flee into exile somewhere. So moving quickly and being decisive and being organized might suggest that he knows about this, that this is premeditated, but it might also be this is just the Alexander we know who will demonstrate this speed of action time and time again, already doing that, thinking, okay, Philip's out of the way. I need to make sure that I'm safe and secure as soon as I can. So there is no simple answer to it. I don't think we'll ever know. How was Alexander prepared for this role? Like, if you can kind of summarize his childhood and how he got to... By by the way, everything we're talking about is in your fantastic book. I loved it. It's (laughs) great. I don't know how you went through all all these details and you said... You actually, in the book, you separate uh, all these rumors and potential things that have low probability of happening. I really like that. So uh, Alexander's childhood, short work with Aristotle, which we know very little, and being in battles alongside Philip. What do we know about all this? A lot less than we'd, we'd like to know, which is, is so often the way with the ancient world. But whereas if you talk about a Julius Caesar or an Augustus or a Roman aristocrat from the first century BC, you have some idea of what the typical education was for someone mm-hmm. of that social class. We don't know what was typical for the Macedonian royal family and then whether or not Alexander's childhood was representative of, of that tradition or something new. And so much is assumed. You know, We know that he has Aristotle as a tutor for several years. Aristotle is not yet as famous as he will become, but nevertheless, it's already you know, recognized as a, a, um, a considerable intellect. But Whereas some people assume, well, Alexander and all the other Macedonian aristocratic youths of his age were all, you know, all taught in a big class by Aristotle. We don't know. It might have just been Alexander. We don't know very much about what they talked about. We know that the relationship remained with Alexander, between Alexander and Aristotle for a long time, that Alexander sent a lot of information and gifts back to his former tutor. And people credit it with giving him an interest in the natural world, which obviously Aristotle would display Um, And clearly there's also, you know, Alexander has, as so many Greek aristocrats would have, this love of literature, but particularly the Homeric epics of the Iliad more than anything else, because this is this is something that has been able to inspire aristocrats in democratic Athens just as much as a prince in a, a royal family. And of course, because on his mother's side, they claim descent from Achilles. So, you know, he's got this personal connection. This is this is talking about your ancestor, you know, the greatest warrior of them all. And that blood is in you, you know, you're going to be just as good. So, you know, we have the story that our, uh, Alexander keeps an annotated manuscript of the Iliad, annotated by, um, by Aristotle, with him at all times, sleeps with it under his pillow, all this sort of thing, actively looks for inspiration from this. So he's coming within this tradition of celebration of military glory, of courage, of skill, but also that Greek tradition of excelling, 
of being first. You know, this is the culture that gives us not simply we, we, we remember the Olympic Games, but that was part of a cycle, a four year cycle of a different Pan-Hellenic festival of athletic competition, cultural competition, all of this thing. It was all about being being first, being best, showing off, winning. This is very much a culture where you you are expected to do well, to to push yourself to your limits and to surpass all others. And of course, you have the stories about Alexander while he's younger, you know, being depressed when he hears the news of Philip's latest victory because his father's leaving him so so little to do. <laughs> could be made up, could, you know, it's it's the, the people are going to invent stories about anyone as famous as Alexander to fill in the gap. And we don't know, you know, anything like as much about his relationship with his mother, Olympias, we'd like to. It's clearly important. Although he never sees her again, once he leaves for Asia Minor, he writes to her and there are fragments from letters preserved or you know, talks about some of the, the comments, the discussions, and sometimes, you know, the exasperation on Alexander's side. But she's clearly a formidable character who will go on to lead an army in the wars after Alexander's death. So these are big personalities, but we don't know outsiders other greeks depict the macedonian court as a place of drunkenness debauchery and you know sort of barbaric braggadocio this sort of thing but again how much of that is normal probably quite a lot of it certainly you'll see it again with alexander and his companions there is this culture of very very heavy drinking that is pushed mm -hmm. to an excess that southern greeks would not consider to be quite proper yes you drink wine but you you water it down you mix it and you you should pace yourself you shouldn't just drink to, you know, um, to to point point of being of of rage, of anger, of you know, um, of collapse. So we have to be very careful. So little is really known in terms of the more public role. We hear of Alexander being given command of the kingdom whilst Philip is away on campaign, and fighting a little war of his own and founding his own city, the first sort of Alexandria, in the early days. We know that at the age of 18, he took part in the Battle of Chironea, and he's credited with a couple of things, breaking the ranks of the Theban sacred band, this um, elite group within the Theban army. And everybody then happily goes off and tells these stories of how Alexander you know, gets on his horse and charges straight at them and leads a cavalry charge into this block of Greek infantry. None of the sources say that. He may well have done this on foot. It may, you know, And obviously, people are going to want to say, well, the young prince did really well, didn't he? <laughs> but presumably he did. And he's got to, this is a, you know, in the Macedonian culture, you do have to justify your right to rule by your bold leadership. By, it comes back to this, this whole sense that you are the Hitaira, you are the companions, you know, you are like the, the warriors of a, a chieftain in, in an Iron Age tribe anywhere else in Europe. You feast with your king, you celebrate with your king, you fight and die with your king, and he does it with you as well. So it's, you have to come within, and bear in mind, for someone like Alexander, he is coming quite late to the party. Philip and his leaders and his soldiers have been winning battle after battle, siege after siege for years. So to be accepted by people like that who know how to win and have done it and are very confident, know and trust each other, but you haven't shared that. Mm -hmm. So he probably has to start making a name for himself at that stage, and this process is far from complete. Um, when he does become king. So he becomes a king and he immediately have to lead the uh, army of M Macedonians and allies, right? To mm. what become a, a battle of Granicus? Is it? Well, not straight away, because first of all, of course, he has the campaign in Greece and sacks mm. Thebes. Because again, the thought is, well, Philip was special. Philip had us all frightened, but now Philip's gone. This... 21 year old kid hasn't really done anything you know he's not going to be able to lead the army the macedonians will just fall apart they'll fight each other so this is a good time to reassert our independence which the thebans do alexander has to act so he spends best part of two years campaigning in greece but also campaigning in the balkans against the illyrians against the thracians making sure that everyone realizes that things haven't changed with philip's departure the Macedonians are still tough. If you don't do what they like, they will come and they will punish you. So Thebes is destroyed as a political entity at this time. And he inflicts similar heavy losses on the tribal opponents to the north. So Alexander does this. And you can see in these campaigns, he's having to prove himself. And then in 334, he crosses to Asia. And 
it's a big army. It's a big, all the contingents from all the allied peoples. It's supported by a navy. It's got lots of other Greeks. It's got Thracians. It's got Illyrians. It's got Paeonians. It's got all sorts. Um, but the, the heart of it is perhaps a third, perhaps a little more of Macedonians. These he leads and he advances with part of his army. Again, the bulk of the Macedonians, plus some of the more favored allies, like the, the cavalry from Thessaly and this sort of thing, to confront the army that's been gathered by the local Persian satraps who are waiting at the river Granicus basically to see what happens. They don't know what's what's going on. Alexander moves towards them and then against the advice of Pausanias, the, the Philip's one true general, you know, Philip praised him as the only one he's ever really found, that man he could trust to do independent things, go off on his own. Philip didn't need to supervise him, but he was always successful. And there is this tradition of Pausanias says the sensible thing. As, oh, sorry, Pausanias, Parmenio. What am I talking about? I'm uh, uh, not paying enough attention. Parmenio says the wise thing. Alexander says, no, I'm not going to do that and proves to be right anyway. So at Granicus, he attacks across a river. I suspect fights the Persians when the Persians weren't expecting anything. So this is why the battle is so confused. They're not properly deployed because nobody sane would attack across a river at the end of a long march. You know, that just doesn't make sense. So... But Alexander, again, has to prove himself. And there is an element where, although the initial expeditionary force that Philip had sent under Parmenio had done well, during the confusion after Philip's death, they've actually lost a lot of ground. They've been hemmed into quite a small part of Asia Minor. So there's a there's probably a confidence issue. You know, It's rather like um, any conflict or competition. If you can start out really hard, you can impress the enemy, frighten the enemy early on. Whereas if you seem cautious, they're going to get more confident. Mm -hmm. So there's an element of display about all of this, but it's a big gamble because Alexander ends up leading a charge into the middle of a mass of Persian cavalry fighting hand to hand. He is almost killed. You know, the plume of his helmet is chopped off. The man who's doing it is just raising his sword arm for another blow when that hand's um, chopped off, chopped off by Clytus the Black who's there defending, protecting Alexander. But, you know, if he'd been a little bit slower, Alexander could have been crippled, could have been dead months into the campaign. And that's probably it, because there is no heir and there's no one to unite the, the Macedonian army. So it's very risky, but it pays off. And it's partly because he can trust his army to fight well, but it's also showing to them, look, I'm just like my father. I'm going to win. Things haven't changed. I know I can trust you to fight well. You can also see how well I fight. So it's sort of confirming that relationship. But one thing, one of the reasons Alexander can lead his army in such a heroic fashion, you know, he leads charges, he fights hand to hand, at which point, as a general, he can do very, very little. He can't see much. He's focused on the people trying to kill him, what's happening immediately around him. But he can do that because he can trust all his subordinate commanders at every level to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So you set the Macedonian army up and you fling it at the enemy. After that, you don't need to do very much. You're not, you're not having to manage the battlefield. You're not having to commit reserves. You just rely on everyone at whatever level doing the right thing and fighting hard, and you're going to win. So that shows that he trusts this very close team that the army has become. He basically relied on what Philip has built, which is... Mm. Entirely. <laughs> this, is, this is Philip's army winning victories. You know, yeah. Some of Alexander's contemporaries will have more senior posts as the war goes on. But virtually everybody at the start of all ranks are Philip's appointees, Philip's veterans. They know what they're doing. They've proved themselves to be very good and they fight in exactly the same way as they fought under Philip. They'll fight under Alexander. The campaigning style is, is, is the same. Some of the distances are, are longer because mm -hmm. the, the sheer sort of scale of the theater of operations is just so much bigger. But basically it's Never give the enemy a break. Never let up. Fight all the way through the year. Keep on fighting and siege after siege after siege. We focus on the big battles, but it's the sieges that mean that this victory is permanent. That you actually conquer and occupy this territory and that people start surrendering to you because they think, well, we can't risk a siege. If somebody can spend nine months capturing Tyre, then they're going to come for us in the end. So better to make terms if we can while we've got a chance. I know, I know you don't like speculating, but I'm curious... Mm -hmm. If it was Philip leading the army in the Battle of Granicus, he probably wouldn't do what Alexander did. He had nothing to prove to anybody. He might well have thought, I can actually outwit these people over the next few days rather than... He has a problem. Whoever you are commanding that Macedonian army, you've invaded the Persian Empire. 
Mm-hmm. So it's up to you to defeat the Persians. It's not up to them to defeat you other than in the sense that you're on their territory. But they can choose to wait because at this stage, you are still a very small force. You know, this is Greek armies have come east. They've attacked the Persian Empire before. They've had successes. They've plundered some of the areas. They've captured a few cities or made them defect. Spartans have done it. The Thebans have done it. Mercenaries have done it. But in the end, they always go home because they get bored. So the Persians probably expected this Macedonian attack to be much the same. And when Philip sends his advance guard, but then things slacken off for a couple of years, in part because Philip's dead, they're probably thinking the same thing's going to happen again. You know, they'll they'll lose interest, they'll get bored, we can buy them off, or they'll just go home. So there is pressure on the Macedonian commander to make it clear to the Persians you're not going home, because if you don't do that, why should any local community defect to you? Mm Mm-hmm. Because if they know the Persians are going to be back in a year or two, then you know, it's a seriously bad move to make friends with them. And you need food. This is one of the basic problems you'll face all the way through is supplying this very large army. It's not large by Persian standards, but it's very large by Greek standards, and you're a long way from home. You can't bring supplies all the way from Macedonia to keep feeding your men. You've got to get it locally, so or from as near uh, close by as you possibly can. So you need allies. You need to persuade people. So there is pressure on the Macedonians to to attack and to win and to start winning quickly. So I think Philip would still have forced the uh, Persians to battle. But again, you feel, yeah, maybe he wouldn't have been quite as bold and as to the point of recklessness of Alexander. But then mm-hmm. again, Philip had made his, his career around surprising people on turning up where they least expected and doing the things they didn't expect. So you never quite know. When it comes to diplomacy, it seemed to me... It- from the book that Philip uh, was more diplomatic or maybe he had to do it because he didn't have this force that everybody had to reckon with. Is it fair? I think it is. I mean, you certainly you can't imagine Alexander ever boasting that he was prouder of his diplomatic achievements than his military ones. You know, this is clearly someone who is selling himself to the world very much on I am the great warrior, I am the great general, I am the great king. Um, Philip does all of those things and does fight, but and Alexander does negotiate. And, you know, he wins over particularly these communities on the West Coast, you know, in Ionia and this area where... There have been problems. The first Persians have faced problems here before when they're on the fringes of the empire. The local satraps, the local dynasties that you support sometimes think, actually, we can do without the, the great king all, there, all, the, all the way over there to the east. A long way away he doesn't really help us very much. He's not really that much of a threat. So he does do the diplomacy and he'll do it very well in Egypt, for instance, where um, the Persians aren't too popular. And Alexander overruns Egypt with no real fighting at all. Mm-hmm. He's likely to receive a welcome. That was one for him to mess up. If he'd behaved arrogantly, if he'd attacked the local population, the Egyptians um, insulted them, then maybe he would have had problems. But otherwise, they don't like the Persians. They're happy to have anybody else. So he treats them with uh, courtesy, with consideration, with respect, and that helps. So he does do diplomacy, but... There may also be a difference that Philip was dealing with people he very much understood in that the Macedonians Mm -hmm. have traditionally, they're part of the Greek world, particularly as far as they're concerned. And Philip spent time in Thebes. You know, he does know how a Greek aristocrat ticks, how a Greek city state works. He knows the Illyrians. He knows the Thracians because the royal family has been intermarrying for some time anyway and diplomatic contacts. So probably better than Southern Greeks, he understands them as well. As Alexander moves further east, he's dealing with communities that are new, are unknown, that he doesn't necessarily understand. But again, uh, you know, in cities like Babylon, he'll be very respectful to local traditions, local religions, local cults, pragmatically. You know, you want these people, you don't want them to fight you, you don't want them to rebel, you want them to accept your rule. So there is an element of um, just just common sense. but So there's diplomacy there. It's always there. It's never just about warfare and conquest because in the end, the number of soldiers you have are so small that you cannot possibly conquer all this but then hold on to all of it without winning mm-hmm. people over. And you do accept, you know, people will defect, they'll become satraps under Alexander instead of satraps under Darius. They, they'll gradually, over time, more and more of the, the regional governors and satraps will become Macedonians or Greeks that he's appointed. But at least at the start, he accepts a lot of people. You know, He will later take 
Eastern wives. So he's trying to do these things. We probably, sometimes as well, it's one of the problems. We don't have a detailed account of any of Philip's campaigns or battles. We have detailed accounts of most of Alexander's. So they tend to jump out in the sources and we can talk about them. Instead, whereas we talk in a line or two about a treaty or an alliance with this community, this leader, with Philip, the wars and the, the diplomacy is, is, is equally poorly recorded, but it means that you sort of, it, you, you see it a little bit more easily because you're not writing these long dramatic accounts of battles and fights because they just don't exist. What was a defining battle in Alexander's life, in your opinion? It's difficult. I mean, he fights four major battles in the whole campaign. And that includes the Hydaspes in India. So it's three really against the Persians. And you could even argue that the Battle of the River Granicus, although it's big and important for the Macedonians, is not against the Royal Persian Army, whereas Zissus and Gaugamela both are. Mm -hmm. They're both very important. Gaugamela is the one. The, the, the thing is, there's always a basic problem with Alexander that there is only one of him. If mm -hmm. Darius dies, there will be another claimant to the Achaemenid Persian throne. You know, and of course, later on, when Bessus and the others get rid of him, Bessus declares himself great king. If Alexander dies, there isn't there isn't a, a backup. You know, there isn't a spare. There isn't a replacement waiting in the wings to take over. And even if he had married and tried to have children before he started on this war, they'd again still be too young. So Alexander can die at any point. And to some extent, it's also true if he suffers a defeat at any point, a serious battlefield defeat, and the campaign is probably over. So although in some ways you could argue that Darius has a better army at Issus, particularly in terms of his infantry, than he has at Gaugamela, if Alexander had failed at either one, that would be the end of it. That's it. The whole thing is over. And the probability is you'll lose almost everything you've gained if you survive at all, because you're a long way within enemy territory and people will start to think, well, there's no point being friends with the Macedonians if, again, the great king is coming back because he's not going to look too kindly on anyone who joins them. So this is the time to rebel. It's the time to turn against them. So at each stage, I suppose Gaugamela is the most spectacular because it's the last really big battle he has to fight against the Persians. So I would probably go for that, although um, you could argue that Issus is the same thing because it's the first confrontation between Alexander and the great king and Alexander wins and wins in dramatic fashion even though the battle begins when the Persians have ended up behind the Macedonians almost by accident. You know, neither side really knows where the other one is and they blunder into each other. So um, that's important. But then also, you know, Alexander could have lost the war at Tyre if he hadn't captured that city. It's why he spends three quarters of a year and huge resources and all this manpower, all this labor to take the city of Tyre, because if he doesn't, then... Why should anybody else, you know, accept him? Well, it's the same as he'll spend two months fighting at Gaza and get wounded there um, and nearly die there. So, you know, he takes risks in sieges. The sieges, again, are important. We, we tend to talk about battles because battles have interesting tactics and the dramatic accounts, and they're what we judge generals on. But they're not the only part of a war. It's, it's all part of a bigger thing. And Alexander spends a large part of his life fighting and risks his life and takes lots of wounds. Most of these are in much smaller engagements, and particularly as he goes further east. And so he's fighting all the time. He's taking risks all the time. So I think for Alexander, particularly with his, this heroic um, attitude, almost every fight is more important, is the next mm -hmm. one. Because again, he could die in any of these. And if he dies, the At army is in serious problems because the chances are that no one will be able to establish control over it that won't be challenged by somebody else. And the further away you are from home, the, the worse that becomes. Do you think he realizes it or he's just completely delusional at that point where nobody can beat him for so long? And he has this idea that he's a descendant of God and every time there is a battle, he finds a way to win. It's so difficult to know because, again, we don't know yeah. the inner workings of his mind. Some of it's habit. This is the life he knows is fighting wars and being on campaign. He doesn't tend to do very well whenever there's a lull. You know, these are the times where he gets drunk and will kill Clytus in a rage um, when they're, none of them are coping very well. So I think it's an element of habit. You could see Alexander as without fear, you know, he just thinks, yes, I'm safe. I'm always, but then you'd think, well, he has been wounded a lot. And of course, there's a serious wound in, in India, but he still fights after that. You know, he's still, there is no, the old idea that sometimes people would say, oh, he seems to be crippled. He's not really active after that 
isn't borne out by the sources. It might be that he drives himself. He has such this such a sense of who he should be and how he should behave that he makes himself keep doing this. He is a little bit more reckless, even by his standards, in those later campaigns. You know, when he does get shot in the chest by an arrow, it's because he's got impatient, thinks the assault's too slow, so he's climbed up a ladder himself, got on the wall, the ladder breaks, jumps down into the the village and starts fighting there and gets surrounded. You would have to wonder, I mean, modern studies of how people cope with the stress of combat suggest they might get to the point where the fears are growing and it makes them reckless. You know, they're almost, Mm. they're they're less careful. And, you know, I happened to be reading just a day or so ago a a book about um, Patton, you know, the famous German from the Second World War. And one of his statements early on was he didn't think any man was brave but that it's how you, what the things you forced yourself to do and made yourself to do, which is you know, very odd in a man who's recorded elsewhere of sticking his head over the parapet in a rifle range to see whether or not he was still, still had the courage to do it. You know, they're, they're a very strange individual who came out this very sort of aggressive, snarling, warlike manner all the time. But that actually this is someone who's making himself do that because he wants the end result. And he's, this is the man I should be, so I'm going to make myself that. But with Alexander, who knows? I mean, he might simply think it, it so much depends on all this stuff that comes out later on about him being the, the child of Zeus Amon, you know. Does he buy into this? Is this a cynical thing from a political point of view? People will follow me if they think I'm special, if they think I'm more than human and they will be more loyal to me. Or does he really think that he is special? He is um, somehow protected, safe. Or does he just not care? Is it the Achilles approach, you know, where, okay, I'm going to die young, but I'm going to be more famous than anyone else? You know, the, the classic thing, even on the, the the shield that he's given in the Iliad, where you have the contrast between the scenes of war and the, the pastoral sort of conflict of, you know, do you live a nice, quiet, comfortable age, uh, to, to live to comfortable old age, or do you keep on taking risks until eventually your luck runs out? And even there, you know, you're not sure the poet has a clear answer as to what the right thing to do is. Alexander, this is clearly a a big deal for him. This is the stuff he reads. But again, we just don't know. We don't know what made him tick. All we can say is what he did, when we're lucky anyway. He keeps on doing this. He keeps on taking risks. But um, it's not something we can pin down. We can't say with clarity that this is Alexander and this is why he's doing all of this. This is what he's thinking. That sort of information just isn't there. So uh, he prevailed and, and uh, took over the Persian Empire. Mm. He goes to India, but in a sense that in my understanding, it almost was easier to dominate Persian Empire because you won major, won major battles and you get the entire territory. Versus India, you have to win province after province after province is it fair to say i think there's yes there's there's a basic truth if you've got something that's already united that already has an organization a government then it's easier to sort of lop the top off and put yourself in its place and start to act like the great king and do the same thing now you know he doesn't entirely do this and he does replace a lot of the senior people, but he still relies on, there aren't many Macedonians and Greeks out there that he can send out to administer and run this new empire. It isn't a complete change of who's in charge. Sometimes it's just the top level. Sometimes even people at the top level are still um, from within the Persian empire and they are still satraps. They're still governors. They're still military commanders. And you're adding to your army all the way through contingents from the people who've been fighting against you. So I think it probably is. It's more coherent. The big test would obviously be consolidating this power. Mm -hmm. We, we again, forget how quickly this all happens and how busy Alexander is. He never really sits down. And that's, you know, you could speculate again. Does he keep fighting because he understands that? And it's much easier than sitting down and saying, okay, how will I govern the Persian Empire from now on or whatever I'm going to call it? And that's dealing with boring administration, it's dealing with petitions, it's listening to appeals, it's all this sort of thing. Um, Whereas I know how to go and fight, I know how to go and take the next mud brick village that I come across. So it is more difficult when you come into areas. Another problem is, of course, that word of Alexander has spread throughout Persia. You know, this is an area where people do communicate and they start to hear, okay, this bloke and the Macedonians, they are formidable, they are dangerous, (laughs) they've won all these battles. When you come to a different tribal group, a different local kingdom, a different leader in India, in the mountains, 
then they're not necessarily that impressed that you defeated somebody 50 miles away, let alone 100 miles away. Because, well, you know, that's just a load of foreigners. We don't like them anyway. We don't care. <laughs> and we are the greatest and most warlike people that we we know about. Therefore, why shouldn't we stand up to the Macedonians? You know, what have we got to lose? I'm sure it'll be, we've beaten everybody else. Why should they be any different? So your reputation counts for less in a more divided um, society, a different political setup. So I think it is. And I think that there is also, there's a clear sort of lack of clarity. It's, one of the paradoxes of Alexander the Great is he can inspire his soldiers to feats of endurance, to fighting incredibly hard, to taking risks, and he can empathize with them. You know, the, the, the story of the man sitting in his chair by the fire when they're in the mountains, and this, this bloke's almost, um, you know, dying from exposure and suddenly wakes up realizing he's sitting on the king's stool and Alexander just reassures him, look, don't worry, if this were a Persian, you, you know, you'd be killed, but we're Macedonians, we're all in this together. He can do all of that. He can wait for the last man to come in through the desert when they're, you know, they've forced marched their way through without water. But he can also completely misread the sense of, well, we, you know, we've won all these victories. We'd quite like to enjoy the spoils. It would be nice to go home sometime. He doesn't seem to understand the successive pleas from different groups within the army for release. For let's, let's, just, you know, let's just finish. We've done it. You've told us we were off to conquer Persia. We've done it. We've defeated the empire. We've got vengeance. Okay, you said we had to go and find Darius, make sure he was dead. Well, we've done that. He is dead. But suddenly we keep on advancing. You know, there is that element. He, he manages to persuade and cajole them so far, but he doesn't quite seem to under, get how most of the soldiers and officers think and how they feel. So that there's this odd mixture within him. Or he doesn't care because he thinks, well, I'm Alexander. I can always win them over. They'll always follow me because I'm Alexander. There's a mixture of, of in several ways. It's all coming under strain. There is far less clarity of purpose once he gets to India, particularly once he's moved beyond any area that could even, in the, the most optimistic interpretation, be seen as having ever been part of the Persian Empire. So it does change at that point so it, it's and it's it's harder yes i think it definitely is harder but everything his army's tireder the objective is less clear possibly even for him and for him it's just well i keep doing this because i'm good at it and i like it and I, I know what i'm doing but it's it's harder because there isn't until perhaps he'd gone even further into india where you do start to have some more unified kingdoms that would be a challenge to defeat but again if you can defeat them it's more coherent. It's more likely to come over to you as Persia had done. But that's, he never quite gets that far. Yeah. So he eventually decides to go back with his army and he dies. Right. And I guess in a sense, he's dying young on top. It's almost like John Lennon, right? It kind <laughs> of puts him on uh, in this immortal position. Yeah. I mean, he never gets to be the old hero. He never yeah. gets to be the Philip. He never gets to show the scars of his, you know, very hard life. Um, he doesn't have to deal with the really hard business of convincing everybody within this huge and disparate empire he's conquered that it's they are part of one empire. They are going to acknowledge his rule. They're going to stay loyal and they're going to, when eventually he has an heir, accept that person to go on. But he is still so young. He's not expecting to die. You know, he's planning. It's All the sources are full of all his plans for the future. Immediately the expedition down to the Arabian Gulf, but also then... You know, is he going to North Africa? Is he going to Western Europe? Wherever it might have been. He's planning on doing all the same things that Alexander likes doing, Alexander knows how to do. But it is, there's an element where every image of him shows a young man. And now, the Emperor Augustus will achieve this by rigorously controlling his public image. Mm -hmm. um, so that, but he does age, you know, he does live on into his 70s. He does have face different problems. Alexander sort of gets to do the glory, the excitement, the adventure. He doesn't do the drudgery of being a ruler. Um, and I think, yes, he never has a chance to fail. So had there been, there are rebellions in Bactria, in Sogdiana, in you know what's now Afghanistan, that he faces, but he manages to suppress them at least up to a point pretty brutally. But those areas would always be difficult to control for any leader, and they're going to break away from the Seleucids several times in the, the generations to follow. So I think, yes, he does. He sort of steps out at the peak of things. And he also, he dies preparing for a campaign. He doesn't, doesn't lose. You know, he doesn't do a Napoleon mm -hmm. and go so far and then lose. Um, so he doesn't have that scene. He's the ever victorious general. And he dies in his bed, even though, you know, not in battle, in spite of all these wounds. So 
yes, I think that there's a lot of that. He captures the imagination because he remains the the youthful hero and that sort of sense of the the pale eyed, young looking, fair haired. It's it's very. It becomes quite a powerful image in Western culture of what a hero should look like and how they should be and how they should act as well. You know, there's an element of sort of cool about Alexander, the the kid who plays by his own rules. You know, he ignores the advice of wiser heads, but he gets away with it because he just. <laughs> He's just great at everything. Um, so yes, I think it does. It it a lot of the image builds on this that he never gets to. He never gets to fail. He never gets to be old. He never gets to have to do the hard slog of being a successful leader. I have a couple of hypothetical questions for you. Um, Alexander at his prime, and Philip at his prime. Mm. If they have the same army and they face each other. Who wins? The answer would always be that actually they literally do have the same army because these are the same soldiers and the same officers. So it's always Philip's army. It's it's this isn't a situation that could arise. So I'm um, I mean, the interesting thing is in the ancient tradition, the perception is that Alexander is the greatest general. So mm-hmm. Plutarch pairs Julius Caesar with Alexander, Rome's greatest general with Greece's greatest general. Appian when he talks about the death of Caesar, compares him to Alexander. Again, natural for a Greek author to do that. You have the stories that are told by Livy and others of Scipio Africanus meeting Hannibal, you know, the great Carthaginian general, and Scipio was the only Roman to defeat him in battle, asking Hannibal, who are the greatest generals of all time, number one spot, Alexander the Great. And you don't have to argue that. And then Pyrrhus, and then Hannibal says himself, and you know, Scipio has this story, well, what if what if you'd beaten me, then I'd put myself first. You know, this sort of this, this story of, of Punic <laughs> flattery and all this sort of thing. But again, the, the, the interesting thing is the basic assumption, Alexander's the best. So for the ancient world, that would be the case. Um, but again, it's, it's, you know, you could never know. There are people who command exactly the same army, just with a few minor changes. So they're not, they're not going to fight each other. You primarily focused on Rome, and you've written several books on Rome. So Alexander was almost a coincidental, just interesting project for you. When you look at the Roman history, who was the most fascinating figure, in your opinion? Oh, that's very difficult. I've got a, a very soft spot for Julius Caesar, because that was the first book I wrote that sold particularly well. So he's been good <laughs> to me. And it's a very good story. Um, and it was noticeable going back to look at Philip and, then, and even Alexander, Whilst there's, there's far, far less than we'd like that survives written about Philip, even the material that survives about Alexander is nearly all Roman in its, its era. It might be written by Greeks, but it's written in the Roman era. And so much of it, the best sources are 400 years after Alexander's death, you know, 400 plus. So with Caesar, you can read his own words for his campaigns. You can read Cicero's letters. That era of the first century BC and the era of Cicero, because of all his writings, you get a greater sense of the personalities of people like Caesar, like Cicero, Pompey's a difficult man to read, Mark Antony, even Augustus in his early days, that makes them a bit more human. There is something deeply frustrating writing about Philip and Alexander that you can't quite get to them. And while that's a problem for any figure in the ancient world, it's a little easier with the Romans. So I, I'd i say, uh, you know, it's always you, when you write about someone, you develop a strong feeling towards them. So I found I my opinion of Mark Antony declined writing the book on him. <laughs> that for both Caesar and Augustus increased. For Philip, it greatly increased. Alexander, it did, but it's sort of in a slightly different way. So um, we'll see. We'll see. I'm not sure who, who when I'll next do a biography. But, um. My question to people who are specialized in a particular field is like, you have, you see dreams at night. Do you ever seem dreams to talking to these people or being in that era? No, no, I, I don't. I mean, I'm, I'm, I normally sleep like a log, so I don't remember <laughs> the dreams if I have them. But um, no, it tends to be, um, you might dream about writing a book or maybe failing to meet a deadline or something like that. But you don't, <laughs> unfortunately, it would be nice if you could. The danger is, I mean, I find because I also write historical novels, I'm always worried that something I will imagine, because with a novel, you're obviously trying to create a three-dimensional, a real world. Your reader has to buy into it to accept mm-hmm. this as real on its own terms, which they'll do if they're reading, you know, a science fiction story or fantasy or anything. It's got to be real enough for you to make make the story matter. You care what happens to these people. I'm always a little bit worried I'll invent something for one of those that I'll then think was real. 
and will start to uh, I don't think it's happened um and the, the greatest fear is that you'll think of, you know, that, oh, isn't there a reference to that somewhere? And you'll be searching through all the sources only to discover it was something you made up 10 years ago. <laughs> um, but it hasn't happened so far. And I, I'm, I'm trying to make sure it doesn't. But you, you know, you, you can't ever be, be, be that certain. But it's, um, it's one of those things that I think a lot about this. But for some reason, it doesn't, doesn't seem to come in that respect. It doesn't seem to come in dreams. Um, I think your latest published book was The Wall. I think nonfiction one, right? Part of the City of Victory tr- uh, trilogy, yeah. right? You you were t- telling me earlier that you write another book right now. Yes, well, I've got a nonfiction book coming out in July in Britain called The Eagle and the Lion, and then in September in the United States called Roman Persia, and it's it's in a sense it follows on from Philip and Alexander because it's the story of Roman contact with the Parthian Empire and then the Persian Empire right the way through from the the early first century BC through into the seventh century AD when they they fight this last really bitter war. The Romans are almost destroyed, but prevail. And then a few years later, the Muslim Arab armies just expand and Persia is overrun in a matter of years. The Romans lose all their Eastern Empire, apart from you know very little bits. It's, the Eastern Roman Empire at this point is reduced to being just a biggish medieval kingdom, but it isn't a great power anymore beyond that so it's that story that's how it ends but it's all the story of that contact and it's it's a story where the romans in particular are always talking about alexander and his campaigns Mm. and they're imagining similar victories and because of alexander they have a greater sense of how big the world is and what's out there and these areas but there are lands that have been part of the seleucid empire that are divided so the seleucids had controlled syria the palestine all that area that's Roman. But Babylonia, this area remains Parthian and then Persian, even though you've got Greek cities like Seleucia on the Tigris, which is one of the greatest Greek cities in the world. So an area that you'd think historically and culturally would be a unity, should be part of one state, is actually divided between two empires. So it's it's that story, but it's also the story of the, the rivalry that has surprisingly little fighting in it. They never try, and no Roman emperor really tries to do an Alexander. And the Parthians and the Persians don't really try to reclaim all the lost Persian empire as they claim to. There are a few possible exceptions, but for centuries, although they fight wars, they're very limited. It's about prestige. It's about money. It's about control and dominating in the local regions, but it's not life or death struggles between these two, two big empires. And there's an element of grudging respect between the two that's quite interesting so it's it's sort of following on that that story of what happened to this what had been alexander's empire in the centuries that followed you've studied the the ancient world and all this uh, fantastic leader and you were able to write the non-fiction where you recreate that world around you were you able to take anything that you've learned from these people and apply it to your day-to-day life and did it make you better or worse as a person? <laughs> Do you compare yourself to them saying like, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's best. I mean, you've got this the famous story of Julius Caesar seeing, while he's in his 30s, seeing a bust of Alexander the Great and weeping because he'd achieved so little by comparison compared to <laughs> Alexander. I think it's best not to hold yourself up to the standards of these people, like, partly because their lives were pretty dangerous and a lot of them might end, you know, die violently. But also, I think that if you if you've, you naturally write about things. It very often makes you a spectator. So you're quite happy to sit back and watch and see. Obviously, the a big theme with all ancient literature is the, the moral sense that, that men succeed because they deserve to, because of their character. And their character is essentially unchanging. They're born that way. And that's how they always act. And it just plays itself out in their life. Studying any form of history, whether it's on the ancient world or any other's, gives you more sympathy and understanding for other human beings and shows you how they act, how they behave. Because in the end, that's why history is interesting. Because these are people basically like us. They may come from different cultures. They may have different attitudes. They may do things that make us shudder. But essentially, they're human beings and their emotions are very, very similar. And you can read one of Cicero's letters and you, you, can, you can see the tangible upset when his daughter dies, his, his beloved daughter dies. And that's a very natural, very human thing. You can see it on tombstones, monuments set up by parents to a, a child that's died. You know, there's, there's one on uh, one of the, the settlements just south of Hadrian's Wall that it's 
there is a carved image of this little girl that's that's done rather like a child's drawing. So you have her playing with a ball, and, and you know the way that children will always draw four fingers and a thumb because they know that's what you've got. They've done the same thing. On that, it's people will often tell you all sorts of guff about the ancient world and say, well, you know, infant mortality was so high, nobody really invested much emotion in their children. That's clearly complete nonsense. You've only got to look at these things where you see them mm. reacting as people would today because they're human beings. And it's it's why history has value and it's why history has interest, but it's also, it's why history is possible. If they were completely alien to us through their culture, we wouldn't be able to understand them at all. And I, I just don't think that's the case. They're, people have not changed. So... I hope it, it helps you to understand the world better.